Salam, and welcome to the People of Palestine podcast. I'm your host, Sajal Wishahi. Welcome back to the People of Palestine podcast. Today I'm sitting down with my friend Linda Miari. Linda and I met through a Palestinian support group back in October, and I am so thankful our paths crossed because I got to know a little bit about her story, which, by the way, is incredibly inspiring. And she's here today to share her story with all of you. So, Linda, welcome. Hi. Thank you for having me here on your podcast. And I'm truly honored to be here and share my story with you and your listeners. Of course. Um, I'm honored to have you here. Um, <clears throat> so can you tell us a little bit about where in Palestine your family hails from? Sure. So both of my grandparents from my dad's side come from a small village called Akbara, which is uh, located in Safad, northern Palestine. Amazing. And did you grow up there? No, actually, I've never been there. I never visited Palestine before yet. Inshallah, one day you'll be able to. Um, so where did you grow up uh, mostly? I was born and raised in Lebanon in a refugee camp called Dain al-Halwe. And that's where I spent 19 years of my life. Can you explain kind of what the refugee camp was like growing up? Yeah, sure. So a refugee camp uh, was established in 1949. And a big, I can say it's a very small size uh, camp, but it's considered one of the largest uh, camps in Lebanon, one of, out of uh, 12 camps. And the life there was, uh, I can say, interesting. <laughs> As a refugee, the education was very important and we really treasured education. Mm. But you are not allowed to dream big because most of your human rights are taken and e- even. Um, the choice of the profession was limited Mm. Um, after the refugees were forbidden from practicing 75 professions. So it makes it challenging to be there. And uh, the life there wasn't safe, Mm -hmm. shooting, killing, bombing, and a lot of mental issues and um, generational traumas Mm -hmm. that we were not aware of were part of our life. And Mm -hmm. I kind of grew up into this, so I didn't feel it's not something scary. I felt it's normal. But all I wished for always um, is no one to be killed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, when did you start to kind of realize that living in a refugee camp and witnessing the things that you witnessed was not really normal like when when did you start to realize that so the transition happened uh when we had a war like when israel invaded lebanon in 2006 Mm -hmm. Um, my mom is ukrainian and so we are as her kids and um we were able to escape the war and uh, the ukrainian embassy helped us and at that time my dad was a refugee so he was was not allowed to escape with us or to leave the country Mm -hmm. just because he's a Palestinian refugee. And that's when it clicked, like being a refugee is really hard. And this was one of the hardest experiences or goodbyes Mm -hmm. I experienced. Yeah. So now after acknowledging a different reality in Ukraine, that's when I started to understand how dangerous it is. In fact, the life in the camp. Mm -hmm. So when we returned back to Lebanon in 2007, um, I start to feel like this place, it, it doesn't, like, I don't belong to this place. It's not my place and I don't belong here. Mm-hmm. But my optimism um, kind of gave me, um, gave me a push to enjoy the moment and the present and um, just enjoy every moment. I felt like this is not going to stay like this forever. There's mm-hmm. going to be a change later on. Mm-hmm. So now looking back, I decided to take with me only the beautiful experiences I've experienced. 
mm-hmm. which is the family gathers and uh, my mom played guitar and she would always have her friends we had a very small house very small room in a in a very small room we would gather all together nowhere to sit mm-hmm. and she would play the guitar and everyone will just sit and sing with her and that was one of the beautiful memories i have in the camp also the kind people there also a lot of beautiful moments and the resilience of the people that i just want to keep with me as a beautiful memory i can say that is beautiful um it's it's oftentimes something that I, i admire um when people recall like very um very harrowing harrowing moments in their lives that they're able to take um the positive out of it and the fact that you had this optimism especially at a young young age is so admirable and so beautiful um and so can you uh kind of give us like an overview of what life was like for your family outside of living in the refugee camp when you went to Ukraine and now living in the States, what has that been like for you? It's definitely a very different lifestyle and perspective for each stage. When we moved to Ukraine for a year, it made me appreciate my mom's strength and resilience for witnessing the challenges she overcame. Because when we moved to Ukraine, we started from scratch. And despite all the challenges, she was able to empower us to embrace our new culture and to dive deeper into our Ukrainian root. We were able to explore the country, the traditions. We learned new songs with our Ukrainian family. And experiencing life in Ukraine was something to remember. It got much easier after living in Ukraine for a year. We became fluent in the language. We understood better the culture. And after the end of the school year, we decided to go back to Lebanon so we can reunite with my dad. Now, after transitioning to living in the U.S. with my husband and now our kids, we decided to raise our kids in the U.S. And just because we wanted them to have a peaceful life and a better future. And this is why I'm really grateful for my husband. He is so resilient and determined to make a difference in his life and also to create a better future, whether for himself or his family. And I truly admire and value this quality in him and also in my dad, because both of them worked really hard and they never gave up no matter what circumstances they are in or how hard or how impossible it felt. They kept going. Now, for my family, for my parents and siblings, they had a different path. They decided to move to Ukraine again right before the war in Ukraine. And unfortunately, the war started and they became twice a refugees. But thankfully, they are now in a better place, in a peaceful place where they feel they belong to. And this is very important to our family. And I hope no one will ever go through wars anymore. Now, Despite the opportunities and the blessings, the distance from our family remains a challenge for us. We miss them a lot. We value our closeness and being surrounded by them a lot. So sometimes it gets hard and it feels, it comes with an ache. But I'm really thankful for my husband. He's always supportive and he always puts an effort to facilitate a regular visit so I can see my family and I can spend time with them. And this why it makes the journey much easier. You know, our journey has taught us that home is not a place, but a feeling of belonging. Yeah, I definitely understand what you're saying about living away from your family and how difficult that can be. Um, I've also lived away from my family for most of my life. And the fact that you and your husband make a conscious effort to um, facilitate those visits regularly, I think is amazing. And that is so, so, so important. I wanted to ask you kind of how did you balance your half Ukrainian and half Palestinian identity? Did that feel different when you move to Ukraine or what do you more identify with your Palestinian side? 
interesting question. You know what? When I moved to Ukraine, I realized that I felt more Ukrainian in Lebanon, that I'm feeling Ukrainian in Ukraine. And just because I was always surrounded by my mom's Russian-speaking friends, and we were the same with mixed backgrounds, and it felt so natural. Now, in Ukraine, I noticed an accent, and also I looked different, so it stood out. So I wasn't Ukrainian completely uh, to my Ukrainian friends, nor I was completely Palestinian in Lebanon, which is in a good way because my Ukrainian friends were very curious, genuinely curious about my diverse background. They would always ask me. And my grandparents helped my mom a lot with teaching us with the language and how to read and write. But to answer your question, exploring my identity feels like solving a puzzle where each piece represents a different culture, yet there is always an extra puzzle of another culture that adds richness to who I am, and I love that. Well, I think it's really cool that you grew up with a very... Um, two very different um, identities and that you were able to embrace both of them beautifully. <clears throat> and I'm wondering kind of what lessons did you learn um, from leaving Lebanon that made you appreciate living there or being Palestinian more? After living life in the camp, I gained a profound appreciation of the Palestinian culture. And one of the lessons that resonated deeply with me mm -hmm. was the warmth of the Palestinian culture, its generosity, kindness, mm -hmm. and consideration for others, the majority of the people. Now, despite the challenges faced, there was a strong sense of community within the camp. Let's say if you ever are in danger or in need of help, you could turn to any house you see and the assistance would be offered as if you are one of the family, which is really amazing. And same goes to the act of sharing food. Even if it meant giving up the last meal you have, it would be shared. So it was this sense of belonging and care that made the camp feel like a large family in a sense. And additionally to Lebanon, I really enjoy exploring Lebanon as a country and seeing its beauty. There's a lot of things about Lebanon, a lot of beautiful things, and I will always look forward to explore more Lebanon. That's beautiful. So, Linda, I know we talked about your education um, before, and I was wondering if we could take a deep dive into what education was like for you growing up in a refugee camp? Well, Seja, you've touched a sensitive topic with this question. I attended different schools. I had different experiences. My school journey was a roller coaster, I can say. And yeah, you are right. Palestinian people are revered about education. In grade five, I moved to a new school. And I saw the pain and bullying, and by the way, not from peers, but from some teachers themselves. Now, there's one teacher in particular, her actions haunted me for so many years. She was verbal abusive, emotional, as well as physical. But back then, I did not really realize how wrong it was. It was affecting me, but I, I did not understand what's going on. Now, looking back, I understand the gravity of her actions. She would bump two girls' head into each other, and the reason could be very minor, like forgetting the book or, or the homework. And growing up, I start acknowledging where all of this is coming from. But still, there is no excuse to be violent, and this should never happen to anyone. So, despite all of this darkness, there's another teacher who was so patient. She was amazing. She was different. She had different approach. She was able to lead the whole classroom by herself. I can imagine how hard it is, like having two kids now. I can imagine how hard it was for her to lead the full classroom. But I believe she chose to break the cycle. And I'm sure she grew up in the same environment, but still... 
she decided to have a different approach. And she showed me that leading a classroom does not require fear tactic or violence. And she gave me a lot of hope during that tough time. And now reflecting on my experience, I've realized the importance of considering students' emotional well-being. And it's not just about academic success. Understanding the struggles of the students is very important for their long-term development. And this experience motivated me to pursue life coaching along with the parenting programs. So I can be there for myself, for my kids, and also to support women in the community and kids and refugees. The fact that you can look back and see maybe some of these teachers who use like physical abuse or verbal abuse, maybe they were also going through some really, really hard times is so mature of you to think that way. Um, but also taking that in and trying to use that hurt in a positive way to like advocate for children, for women, for refugees is so respectable because oftentimes we see that hurt people hurt people. Um, but the fact that you're turning it around for generations to come is something that you should be so proud of. Um, and you mentioned that you have kids um, as well. And so I wanted to ask kind of what methods you use to kind of make sure that your kids know about Palestine um, and how are you, how are you teaching that to them? Good question. <laughs> Well, when it comes to teaching my kids, me and my husband, we tailor our teaching depends on their age. So for now, we introduce them to the rich beauty of our culture, which is through dabki dancing. They know that dabki is something Palestinian or Arabic and they love doing it. And we raise in them the deep love for our family. And on the side, I explore Palestinian culture myself through books documentaries and community event because growing up in the camp it felt like i'm living in little palestine honestly we had same town names each family lived in their town and we even had different accent in each town which is funny that small palestinian camp in lebanon however when i moved to the u.s I realized that their Palestinians from Palestine are not aware of our situation in Lebanon. Not also Palestinian in Palestine, but in different Arabic countries. And it brought my attention and sparked the curiosity in me because I felt like I have to delve deeper into our Palestinian history and understand more the culture to better educate myself and also later educate my kids about it. That's really beautiful. Um, and I, and you're right. There are a lot of Arabs and Palestinians, um, kind of all over the world that are still learning about Palestine. So the fact that you take the opportunity to learn for yourself and then teach your kids is beautiful. Um, and I love that you're starting them out with the Depka. That's amazing. And actually, I wanted to circle back on like the education piece really quick because I do have a question out of curiosity because I also don't know much about Palestinians in refugee camps and what opportunities they are afforded. So after you finish school there, um, do in general, do students have opportunities to go to college? And what does that look like um, to get like a higher education? Yeah, we have honor West schools both within and outside of the camp, as well as Lebanese colleges and universities. Amazing. Um, and do they give like scholarship opportunities or what does the application process look like? 
Is it normal? Like Yeah, yeah, okay. it is normal. In fact, it's easier than obtaining education here in the U.S. in terms of the cost. Mm-hmm. And for those who are aiming to get education in American universities or other high-costed universities or institutions, it's um, scholarships are available. That's awesome. That's really good to know. Um I live in Egypt now and like m- more recently because of the things that are happening in, in Gaza, they, um, there were, I think, two universities that are offering full ride scholarships to Palestinian students, um, which is amazing. So to hear that students do have Palestinian students do have opportunities outside of the refugee camp to get a higher education is is really nice to hear. So thank you for educating me on that. Um, yeah, sure. do you, do you have any hope or do you still have hope when it comes to returning to Palestine? It's a very interesting question because yeah. I have <laughs> different feelings about it every time. And now with everything happening in Gaza, you know, the atrocities and everything they are going through makes it hard to be, to have any hope. Mm -hmm. But the Palestinian resilience and love just gives me a little bit of hope that love must prevail someday, you know? Yeah. Yeah, inshallah. It's, um, I'm, I'm like you, every day it changes, you know, like it's, Mm -hmm. it's really hard, especially when you're seeing so much on social media every single day and like the graphic images that are coming out and it's just like, it's so hard to keep looking at that and but like at the same time I think you can relate like you feel guilty if you're not looking at it and seeing what's going on and like Mm -hmm. keeping up with all the news and stuff so I I relate to your statement of like every day this um opinion changes of whether or not you have hope to go back yeah but you know at the end of the day like we just have to like keep faith you know um, on that note, do you have a message to the world about Palestine and Palestinians? Yeah, I hope that the world sees beyond the stereotype and misconception about Palestine and Palestinians in general, because we are people with a rich culture, a resilient spirit, and a deep um, longing for peace and justice. That's beautiful. What is it like right now for you to live in the States? Because I know you live in the States now. Um, My experience is so different from most of my friends who live in the U.S. right now because I live in Cairo and everybody here like loves Palestinians. So I'm wondering, like, has that changed? Has anything changed for you since October 7th in terms of how you're treated in the U.S.? Yeah, I totally understand. And before I answer your question, when I moved to the U.S., I realized that my identity goes beyond my accent or status. It's about who I am as a person. And I cherish this a lot in the U.S. With everything happening right now, people are more aware of what is happening in Palestine, in Gaza, or to Palestinians. Maybe in some cases in a different perspective. But I gained a lot of new friends who share same values, and that's what I want to focus on. Because being part of an amazing community, whether my social media family, my friends, being a member of the Global Shapers, or having resources from uh, to work on myself from fresh start, has been so empowering. And as a small example, a small act that made a big difference One supportive message from a kind shaper led to a group of almost 600 shapers around the world and everyone is working on finding ways to use their knowledge and expertise to to support Gaza, which is so empowerful and so motivating to keep going and not to give up. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm also part of like this huge WhatsApp group that's based out of here in Cairo. And there's like, they do so many things like they go um, to like pack aid boxes and like uh, donate clothes. They're meeting with like people coming out of Gaza. It's like uh, 
such a beautiful thing. And you can like, like you said, like turn to them. If you need something, everyone is like there. Um, so can you, I don't know if you can, but can you talk about some of the projects that you're working on to kind of like help the people of Gaza? Cause I know some people are probably curious to hear about how maybe they can help. Yeah, I will definitely share. And thank you, Saja, for sharing about your experience. It's really interesting to see how people are working together and doing some changes despite all the challenges in these Mm -hmm. hard days. So the group I mentioned earlier is working through initiatives like One Heart, One World, which spreads awareness and information about Gaza. Also, there is Shaper Aid, for raising funds for an era to help directly support the families in Gaza. And Mm -hmm. I also want to mention Connect Palestine, which are working toward raising funds uh, to support Palestinians financially for sure and to provide them with job opportunities and many more. So please check this out for more resources as well. And this is why I'm really grateful for this amazing community. That's amazing, Linda. That's really awesome. So, um, so on that note, Linda, can you do you have uh, a message to the people of Gaza? Yes. Um, my heart goes out to you, and may you find strength and resilience. And I hope for justice and peace to prevail, and for the end of atrocities you are experiencing, because it's not easy what you're going through right now. Linda, I wanted to thank you so much for joining me today and telling us a little bit about your family story. And I just want to say that it's so admirable, all the things that you're doing to um, break the generational trauma and to help the people of Gaza. Um, I hope that all of the work that you're doing is is getting um, traction and that people are following along um, to also help the people of Gaza. Um, and so I just wanted to thank you again for, for joining me today. Thank you, Saja, for having me today. Um, free Palestine. Free Palestine. So there you have it, guys. That is the story of the Ma'ari family. The links to the initiatives that Linda mentioned are in the description of this podcast in case you would like to contribute. I want to thank Linda again for joining me today. If you resonate with our stories and want to become friends with a Palestinian, I highly encourage you to visit our website, www.thepeopleofpalestine.com, and sign up for our Olive Branch program. Once you sign up, you'll be paired with a Palestinian pen pal. It's just our way of extending an olive branch to you and welcoming you into our community. Don't forget to follow us on social media, at the people of Pali, on Instagram and TikTok, and subscribe to our podcast. Until next time, salam.